Phobias are one of the most interesting mental health conditions to talk about. I think that might be because the range of objects people can be phobic of is so wide. And if you don't have a phobia of, say, buttons, it can be very difficult to imagine how a phobia of buttons could have developed in someone who does have compoonophobia. In this video, I'm going to discuss the behaviorist approach to both explaining and treating phobias. So of course, if you remember your behaviorism concepts, you know I'm going to be talking about classical and operant conditioning. These are fairly complex ideas, and I will cover everything you need to know for the psychopathology unit here, but if you want a video of a little bit more depth on the basics of behaviorism, you may want to check out my video in the approaches unit first. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. The behaviorist approach to explaining phobias. A key concept behaviorists share is behavior including phobias are learned, ultimately from some interaction with the environment, so experience. Now, a really important term in this video is the two-process model. This idea comes from Maurer, and it suggests that phobias are initially acquired, so they're first learned, through classical conditioning, which is learning through association. But phobias are maintained, so kept going, through reinforcement. So through operant conditioning, learning through consequence. Let's consider each of these processes in turn. Acquisition. So we gain or acquire phobias through classical conditioning, learning by association. A phobic object like a bee starts as a neutral stimulus. It causes a neutral response, so no response. However, an unconditioned stimulus like the pain of being stung will produce an unconditioned fear response. These unconditioned stimulus response links are automatic. They don't need to be learned. However, when the neutral stimulus, in this case the bee, is paired with the unconditioned stimulus of being stung, an association is formed, and the bee becomes a conditioned stimulus, now producing the conditioned response of fear on its own. Phobias can be generalized, so a conditioned fear response is also experienced in the presence of stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. So a fear of bees could be generalized to other small flying insects. The second part of the two process model suggests that phobias are maintained through operant conditioning, which is a form of learning that occurs through learning the consequences of our actions. A person with a phobia is aware of their phobia and may try to avoid the phobic object and the situations that put them in contact with it. This avoidance leads to a reduction in anxiety, which is a pleasant sensation. This acts as a reinforcement and strengthens the phobia, making it more likely that the person will avoid the phobic object in the future. Let's think about the two process model of phobias, acquisition and maintenance, with a scenario. Laura has a phobia of bees. When she was young, she used to play with bees and she was not afraid of them. However, one day when she was playing with the bees, she accidentally put her hand over one of them and was stung. This sting produced a fear response and Laura panicked and started hitting the bees which caused her to be stung a few more times. This caused her to associate the pain of being stung with the bees. And now whenever she sees a bee, she has a fear response, even though she's not been stung since. This is an example of how phobias can be learned through classical conditioning, through the process of association. In terms of maintenance, a later scenario in Laura's life might be that she's been invited to a summer picnic with her friends. She's looking forward to spending time with them, but when she gets to the park, she sees several bees and becomes anxious. She calls her friends and tells them that there's been an emergency at home and she can't make it to the picnic. She walks away from the park and heads home, feeling sad that she can't spend time with her friends. However, her anxiety decreases because she knows she doesn't have to be near the bees. This reinforces her phobia and makes it more likely she'll avoid the bees in the future. This situation may suggest that Laura's phobia is impacting her ability to engage with her social life and is affecting her day-to-day -day life. She's failing to function. You may want to check you understand the concept of the two-process model by inventing a similar scenario, but using a different phobic object. Evaluating the behaviorist approach to explaining phobias. The classic research by Watson and Rayner in 1920 is the story of Little Albert. In this research, Watson demonstrated when introduced to a rat for the first time, a young child showed no phobic response. However, Watson paired the display of the rat with hitting a large metal pole behind the child's head, creating a loud noise. This resulted in a phobic response whenever the rat was presented alone. Demonstrating phobias can be acquired through association. 
Lil Albert also developed a fear response to other similar objects such as small dogs and furry blankets, demonstrating generalization. There is critical research. Donardo showed that while conditioning events like dog bites were common in participants with dog phobias, at 56% of participants, they were at least as common in participants with no dog phobia, at 66% of participants. Also, when Mendes and Clark studied children with a phobia of water, they found only 2% could recall a negative experience of water, and 56% of parents told researchers the phobia had been present from the child's first encounter with water. These findings suggest the behaviorist approach is not a full explanation for all phobias. Humans also don't commonly display phobic responses to objects that cause the most pain in day-to-day life. For example, when cooking, many people accidentally cut themselves with a knife. However, phobias of knives are quite rare. Whereas very few people are bitten by a snake or a spider, but phobias of snakes and spiders are quite common. An evolutionary explanation might be more valid for fears of drowning, heights, snakes and spiders. These are the dangers that many of our evolutionary ancestors faced, and those of a natural instinctual fear would have been more likely to survive and reproduce, meaning phobias are hereditary. One positive evaluation is what we're about to explore next in this video. The behaviorist theories of phobias have been used to develop effective counter-conditioning therapies, such as flooding and systematic desensitization. These therapies are highly effective treatments for phobias, which suggests that the underlying behaviorist theories they are based on are valid explanations for the development and maintenance of phobias. The behaviorist approach to treating phobias, flooding and systematic desensitization. Both flooding and systematic desensitization are based on the behaviorist principle that phobias are learned associations, and both of the therapies attempt to replace the fear association with the phobic object with one of relaxation or calmness. Both use an idea called reciprocal inhibition. Fear and relaxation are two antagonistic, meaning opposite, emotions. And you can't feel two opposite emotions at the same time. If the therapist can help the client hold the phobic object without feeling any fear, then they've been successfully counter-conditioned and no longer have the phobia. The main difference between these two therapies is how they help the client reach the point of feeling no fear in the presence of the phobic object. Let's start with the stepped approach called systematic desensitization. The therapist will begin by teaching the client relaxation techniques like breathing exercises. Then the client will be asked to create an anxiety hierarchy. This is a list of feared situations with the phobic object, starting with those that are the least feared to the most feared. The client will then be exposed to each different level of the anxiety hierarchy, starting with the least anxiety reducing level, perhaps seeing a photograph of the phobic object, to the highest. However, at each stage, the client will be helped to relax, using relaxation techniques learnt at the start of the therapy. Only when the client is fully relaxed will the therapist move to the next stage. The final stage will likely be holding the phobic object, and when this can be done without fear and with relaxation, the association is extinct and a new association with relaxation is formed. Flooding attempts to counter condition a phobia by immediate and full exposure to the maximum level of a phobic stimulus. This would be the top level of the previous anxiety hierarchy. Now this immediate exposure is expected to cause an extreme panic response in the client. The client is expected to cry, the client is expected to scream, and the therapist's job is to stop the client from escaping the situation. You might be surprised by this approach, but it takes energy to produce a fear response and the phobic object is often not dangerous. So the client can be left in this situation until they run out of energy to cry and scream. At the point of exhaustion, the client is no longer showing a fear response and is being counter conditioned. Now it's really important that the client can't escape and the therapist doesn't end the therapy early. If that happens, then anxiety will decrease due to the removal of the stimulus and the phobia will have been reinforced. You might want to return to the scenario of Laura and the bees. How may a therapist attempt to treat Laura using both flooding and systematic desensitization? Evaluating the behaviorist approach to treating phobias. We can evaluate systematic desensitization and flooding by comparing each treatment option. It might not surprise you to learn systematic desensitization is often the client's preferred treatment. This is because the client is in control of their progress, not the therapist. They can stop themselves going to the next level by just saying they're not fully relaxed at that stage. And of course, flooding isn't appropriate for older people, people who have heart conditions or children. 
Also, if flooding fails and the client is released before the anxiety has subsided, then the phobia will be reinforced. However, flooding is likely to be a quicker process, with systematic desensitization potentially taking more sessions to achieve the same result. A problem with both systematic desensitization of flooding is they may seem to be effective when they're in the controlled environment of the clinician's room, so when the phobia is being treated. It could be that this effect isn't generalized to experiences in the real world. Perhaps someone can overcome their phobia of birds when in a room with a tame bird, but when outside of the therapist's office in the real world, exposed to a large number of wild birds, the phobia might return. We might also argue that systematic desensitization of flooding are both better at treating phobias of objects than treating social phobias. For example, it's easier to build and slowly progress through an anxiety hierarchy about being exposed to buttons or have a full and traumatic experience to snakes in a controlled environment than replicate a party and interactions with strangers in the therapist office. Drugs are an alternative treatment for phobias. As it's an anxiety disorder, tranquilizers like benzodiazepines are used, as well as antidepressants. These can lower anxiety and reduce the phobic response, and they're often a quicker and more cost-effective treatment than systematic desensitization or flooding, as these require multiple sessions with a trained therapist. However, due to the temporary nature of drugs and the side effects, drugs are often not the preferred treatment of sufferers, and are likely to be a temporary solution before therapy. Recent developments of virtual reality technology have allowed the principles of systematic desensitization to be adapted into virtual reality exposure therapy. Garcia Palacitos found 83% of participants treated with VR exposure to spiders showed clinically significant improvement compared to 0% in the control group. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Kat Posnick and Ahmed Romani for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the Psychopathology unit. I hope this was helpful and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.